Hello everyone, Kofi here, and welcome to another edition of the Tutor Med Lecture Series, where everything medicine is simplified. If you are a student preparing for an exam, then you certainly need to watch this video till the end. Subscribe and hit the notification bell for subsequent videos because in this video, we will discuss strategies for exam-oriented learning. In this first part, we will focus on the approach to learning for the multiple choice questions. Hey, have you subscribed yet? If not, kindly do that now. And let's get started. So the first thing you should do is to know the structure of your exam. This is important because your studies is strictly going to be based on the exam structure. For example, for a student of the University of Ghana Medical School preparing for internal medicine exam, you should have the following structure in your mind. 1. Multiple choice questions, then theoretical clinical cases in the written format, objective structured clinical examination, abbreviated as OSCE, picture station, where pictures are projected for spot diagnosis and subsequent questioning, diagnostic station, procedure station, and then viva voce. And note that the approach to learning for your MCQs may be in fact different from how you approach your OSCE. Remember that as a student, your primary responsibility is to devise strategies to pass your exam, not to prove that you've read big books from cover to cover. The second step is to know what the exam wants from you. Examinations in medical school test two aspects, the clinical knowledge and clinical skills. So for the clinical knowledge, the exams test your ability to memorize some concepts in medicine. For example, you can only answer correctly that the axis of the heart is from minus 30 degrees to plus 90 degrees if you've memorized it. So do not demonize rogue memorization because certain parts of the exam test that. Next, while it is true that some concepts may not be understood, the exam also tests your ability to understand the concepts you have memorized. Then, it tests your ability to teach what you claim to have understood. For clinical skills, the exam tests your ability to use your hands appropriately, and here, you see it in OSCEs and in procedure station. Then the exam tests your ability to communicate effectively, as sometimes there is a station on counseling, especially for pediatrics. Now the third step is to know how to approach each exam component, and as discussed earlier, different strategies have to be used for each of them. And so for the MCQs and written clinical cases, the approach is using past questions. It is a waste of time in my opinion to spend lots of time reading only to see questions set by your examiners and you cannot solve them. To tell you the truth, but for past questions, 99% of practicing doctors, including those you hold in high esteem, would not have survived medical school. And so if you ask me, what is the strategy for passing my MCQs? My response would be, number one, pass questions. Number two, pass questions. Number 22, pass questions. Number 100, pass questions. So why the noise about pass questions? The first reason is that you cannot know the, the minds of your examiners except by studying the questions they've set in the past, beginning with their most recent questions. Number 2, remember that you are not studying the questions with the hope that they repeat them. You are using them to guide your learning, as we will look at in a minute. But if you are lucky and the questions are repeated, then that is good for you. The third reason is that, by studying past questions, topics that you won't routinely learn will be learned because it was asked and so you will look for answers for them, indirectly studying them. The last point is that, it guides your learning and it puts your learning into perspective, ready for the exam. Now as a demonstration, let us look at this past question. A 58-year-old man presents with progressive imbalance for a month. The symptoms and signs of cerebellar lesions include the following, except A. Expressive aphasia 
B. Finger to nose dysmetria. C. Desdiadocal kinesia. D. Horizontal gaze evoked nystagmus. E. Intention tremors. You do not have to know the answer. All you need to do is to get an exercise book and then open your textbook and then read on cerebellar lesions. But for this question, the answer is A. Then let's open our reference texts and see how we arrived at the answer. Now, this assumes that you do not know anything about cerebellar lesions. Don't worry. So you open your reference texts and you go to clinical features of cerebellar lesions and then read. And then you see answers like, Symptoms of cerebellar lesions manifest ipsilaterally, that is on the same side, to the site of the lesion. Write it in your exercise book. Then the next clinical feature, cerebellar ataxia. And for that, we have three. Gait ataxia, truncal ataxia, limb ataxia. Then we have intention tremors, which featured in the question. We have this diadocal kinesia, also featured in the question. Then pendular knee jerk. Vertigo, muscle hypotonia, rebound phenomenon, also known as T. Watt Holmes sign. Write all these clinical features from your reference text into the exercise book you've got and then move on. You would even realize that there are even more features like this arthria, which is what? Scanned speech or slurred speech. Then oculomotor dysfunction including nystagmus, cerebellar drift. Some of the reference texts will even give you more information that if the cerebellar lesion is caused by cerebellar hemorrhage, which is acute, a patient might have occipital headaches because of where the cerebellum is, might have neck stiffness, vomiting. All these are signs of meningism. And then raise intracranial pressure. Document all of these into your exercise book and then move on. I know you are probably wondering, hey, how do I get all these things in my head? Hello? This question is also valid for the candidate who is reading page by page. The advantage you have is that, should the question be repeated, there is no need to think about it. You would get the answer. Now this is where the clinical knowledge expectations come in. 1. Your ability to memorize. And to achieve this, mnemonics can help. Mnemonics, mnemonics, mnemonics. Google mnemonics for cerebellar signs and symptoms. If you don't find some, form some. If not, find a way to remember it. So when I googled, I found vanished, but I added Dr. Paul to cover for the other clinical features in the textbook. And so the mnemonic is Dr. Paul vanished when he was asked to examine a patient with cerebellar lesions. So Dr. Paul vanished. D for this diadocal kinesia. R for rebound phenomenon. P for pendular knee jerk. V for vertigo. A for ataxia. N for nystagmus. I for intentional tremors. S for slurred speech, otherwise dysarthria. H for hypotonia. E for exaggerated broad gait. And then D for cerebellar drift, but we used the drift alone here. So get the mnemonics through Google or form some after you've gotten your clinical features from your reference text. Now you will realize that the answer is A, expressive aphasia, because for this arthria, the patient can talk, but he scans his speech, a speech known as staccato, to demonstrate that the patient will speak this way. My name is Kofi and I am called Tutor Men. So he breaks it like that. But in expressive aphasia, they cannot speak at all. Now, because your aim is not to merely solve the questions, but to use them to learn, you try and understand the topic, which is the second expectation. 
understand them. So this is an image showing the cerebellum in the skull and where it is located. So what is it? What is this organ which had the lesion or which this man had a lesion in? You read a bit from the reference text and you find that it has parts like I will demonstrate. So it has the cerebellar hemisphere which is on the right. It has a left cerebellar hemisphere as well. It has a midline structure called the vermis and this is the posterior surface as you can see. Looking at the anterior surface, we look at what is called the floculonodular lobe and then the tonsils. So please take note of these labelings. We will look at them later. But the point is, you try and understand by going further past the question because you are just learning. So on this slide, we want to look at the various functions of the parts of the cerebellum we labeled. Although the question didn't ask us about function, again, because we are learning, we need to know that. We need to go past what the question is looking for. And so the first part is the Aki cerebellum. Aki means old. So the old cerebellum is made up of the floculonodular lobe. And this maintains equilibrium and coordinates eye movement, neck, and then head movement. A lesion in this part of the cerebellum will produce nystagmus because it coordinates eye movement and then vertigo because it maintains equilibrium. Then the next part is the paleo cerebellum. Here it is the midline vermis. The function here is to coordinate the trunk and then the leg movement. So if you looked at the clinical features we found, we found ataxia. And so a lesion here will produce ataxia, but this kind of ataxia will be gait and then trunkal ataxia. If you have that, it means that it is the midline vermis which has a problem. Then the last part is the new cerebellum, which is made up of the cerebellar hemispheres. So here we control quickly and then finely coordinated limb movements, predominantly of the arms. And so a lesion here will produce this diadochokinesia, limb ataxia, etc. So if the question is changed and is asked if this man has nystagmus which part of the cerebellum is involved because you went past the question you would be able to say that it is the floculonodular lobe of the cerebellum which has the problem and so after you've gotten the understanding like we have demonstrated you have to make other points like points on the causes of cerebellar lesions, although the question did not ask you about that. Because for all you know, next time cerebellar lesions will come, they will be asking of causes instead of the clinical features. And so make points on the causes of cerebellar lesions. And then you can also make points on how to investigate and treat cerebellar lesions. So really, in your exercise book, this is what you should be doing. When you, when you find a question, just find answers to that question by using your reference text. And then Google and make mnemonics for your answer so that it, they can help you memorize and then remember them. Then afterwards, try and then get a little background understanding of the topic and then get other relevant components of the topic. Put this information in your text, sorry, in your exercise book and then go over them. Hello, this might seem like a lot of work, but I tell you, it is worth it. It is really worth it.